Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for part four of our webinar series on 3D culture and analysis. This presentation we are about to show you was broadcast live during our 24 hours of stem cells virtual event. You may submit questions during the presentation and throughout the on-demand period. We encourage you to participate. And to do so, simply type your questions into the Ask a Question box and click the Send button. Your questions will be addressed via email following the presentation. Additionally, we will be hosting a live roundtable discussion with R&D leaders in the coming months. We will alert you via email when we open registration. It is now time for our webinar, presented by Dr. Takanori Takebe and moderated by Mark Kennedy. To review products and educational materials that can get you started in 3D, make sure to visit thermofisher.com forward slash organoid. Hello everyone and welcome to today's presentation uh, titled Modeling Inflammation and Fibrosis in Humans with PSC derived steatohepatitis liver organoids presented by Takanori Takebe, Associate Director of the Center for Stem Cell and Organoid Medicine and Professor at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, as well as Professor at Tokyo Medical and Dental University, and Professor and Principal Investigator at Yokohama City University. My name is Mark Kennedy uh, of Thermo Fisher Scientific, and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. So before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive, we encourage you to participate by submitting any questions you may have at any time during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your question into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. So if you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please use the Ask a Question box to let us know of any technical difficulties. So with that, please allow me to introduce Dr. Takebe. So Dr. Takebe is an Associate Director of the Center for Stem Cell and Organoid Medicine, also known as CUSTOM, at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. And as I mentioned, he's also a professor at Yokohama City University and Tokyo Medical and Dental University in Japan. He serves as on the Board of Directors at the International Society of Stem Cell Research, uh, and his lab investigates the mechanisms of human organogenesis and he develops many organoid or many organ technologies from human stem cells, namely organ bud based approaches. He is applying IPSC liver buds into drug discovery as well as transplant applications for patients with a rare congenital metabolic disorder, ultimately expanding the clinical indications to diseases like liver cirrhosis. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Takebe for joining us, and I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction and good uh, good evening, I think, uh, to everyone. And I'm I'm in Japan and good morning from Japan. And my name is Taka Takebe. And thank you so much for some Fisher members for giving me this really high tech opportunity to present our uh, recent work related to organoid. So I just slightly modified my uh, presentation title, so the era of organoid medicine to cover the more broader perspective of what we are working on using the human prepotent stem cells. All right, so I just a uh, little bit about uh, great thanks to my uh, members in the different labs. So I'm currently running uh, five different laboratories uh, in, in, in Cincinnati Children's and Yokohama City University in the middle and Takeda uh, a joint program in the Takeda Pharmaceutical and, and Design Center, which is a little different from my talk, and also Tokyo Medical Dental University. So especially I like to appreciate Dr. Taniguchi, who is uh, also the professor at Yokohama City University, and, and we are working very closely for the translational application of our liberal organoid-based approaches. And also, I'd like to thank for the funding agencies, including the AMET, GST, GSPS, and NICEF, and, and Takeda Pharmaceutical as well. And also collaborator as well. So uh, I'm working in a Cincinnati Children's at Custom, and I am really grateful for the tremendous support from the Custom faculty members at Cincinnati Children's. 
And also, Shinya Yamanaka, working at the Kyoto University, is providing us the, the fantastic stem cell source, which is namely an IPS cells for the translation applications. And with that, I'd like to start my presentation. So just as a way of background, so I'm uh, originally interested in uh, transplant surgery, especially for the liver transplantation. So, so this is the first patient I actually met in the United States uh, when I was uh, uh, taking an internship at the Columbia University. So, so as I said, here is uh, U.S. But the patient I met there was the Japanese patient uh, who is uh, uh, Mr. Asano. And he was very uh, sort of a uh, lucky guy because he was diagnosed as a very severe liver failure back in Japan. But unfortunately, there are a very limited number of uh, transplants in Japan uh, because of probably because of limited gunshots. So his only option was to fly outside Japan to get a, a whole liver transplantation in, in elsewhere. Uh, uh, outside Japan and he was just flying into the Columbia University and finally be able to be transplanted uh, by the whole liver uh, transplant approaches. And now he's completely recovering from the disease and back in Japan and working as a, a elementary school teacher as before. So he was very lucky to be transplanted, but but I think behind the scenes, I think we are missing the very uh, severe statistics like this one. So this is a study uh, statistics from the United States and, and for the transplantations. So as you see from the blue bar, uh, starting from the early 1990s, uh, the demand or waiting patients for the whole organ transplantation is growing over time very intensively. But in contrast, actual transplant case indicated by Greenberg, it remains stable, which simply suggested that the gap is growing and almost hundreds of thousands of patients are just waiting to die. So this uh, uh, is really cat catastrophic and I'm very sad. So I decided to jump into the different field, which is namely a stem cell and organoid field to, to make a difference for the, the patients are waiting for the transplantation. So, so, so to do that, we are very interested in the organoid technologies. So this uh, slide just show you the, the review papers uh, published by Nature, uh, authored by the Cassandra and back in 2015. And as you see here, uh, there are a number of different organ organoid technologies are coming out for the past few years, including the brain organoid and, and, and river organoid and gastric organoid and, and so forth. And, you know, the Dr. Sasai uh, working at the RIKEN is, I think, the one of the founder for this field by publishing a paper for the optic cup organoid paper. And, and and also Hans Krieber's lab uh, uh, and Dr. Toshi Sato is developing a method for developing a, a gastric organoid from the adult stem cell populations followed by many uh, outstanding investigators in the world to develop multiple different organs. I just want to review the, the, the background of the evolution of the organoid field in the next slide. So organoid is initially defined in the uh, early 90s and growing steadily over time, but uh, uh, for the past few years, the, the number of fabrications for organoid is growing intensively, as in this slide. So I think throughout the, the evolution process, I think uh, very uh, roughly summarizing, I think there are many, uh, three major contributing uh, technologies driving the organoid evolution field. So for instance, if you look at the uh, organoid uh, 1.0 version one, I think uh, this is the initial uh, uh, foundation of the organoid technologies. So Dr. Wilson is uh, uh, working with a sea sponge, uh, 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 sea animals, and found that if you uh, dissociate the sea sponge into the single cells and re-aggregating them in a small well, he found the, the entire sea sponge structures can be reformed 
by the Lee aggregation technologies. So, so I think Lee aggregation uh, found in the early 90s is, is clearly a, a very important uh, technology to, to look at the self-organization potential, which is a critical uh, aspect for making an organoid. But afterwards, it turns out the more higher animals like lowland models or monkey model, I think still it's very challenging to make an organoid from just an aggregate. And to tackle this, uh, Mina Bissell and other uh, pioneering uh, scientists uh, using the raminin rich uh, extracellular matrix component or in general uh, known as uh, matrigels is really important for for enabling the self-organization into organoid. So combining with the Li aggregate with the matri gel, so laminin with GCM, uh, she and, and many of the investigators found out the even for the, the loaded model, we can make an organoid, including the mammary organoid or a kidney organoid or a lung organoid. And as a version three, I think this is uh, the major driver for the organoid, uh, uh, increase in organ publication is the human stem cell uh, technologies. So including the adult stem cells and pluripotent stem cells, including the embryonic stem cells or IPS cells. So having that adult stem cell source or a pluripotent stem cell source, uh, Dr. Sasai and Dr. Creevers found out the method to make a human specific organoid. And this was followed by uh, a series of investigators, including Jim Wells and Dr. Taniguchi and Dr. Novrich and Nishi Nakamura, Marissa Little, uh, to make her uh, gut organoid or, or kidney organoid or, or brain organoid and so forth. But today I'm going to really focus on the future of organoid, which I think the organ of medicine or application of, of, of organoid for the medical application. So, so for the past three uh, version of organoid evolution was merely driven by the, the method to make an organoid. But, uh, but it turns out we are now able to make a uh, sort of human miniature version of organ. So I think we, uh, for the future, I think uh, I'm really interested in the promise of, of application of organ into the medical, medical field. To accelerate this process uh, at Cincinnati Children's, we are recently established our uh, a new center called CUSTOM, Center for Stem Cell and Organic Medicine. So Alan Zorn, uh, who is a, a, a noted uh, developmental biologist in a liver field or lung field, uh, is, a, is a director for the CUSTOM and, and co-directed by Jim, James Wells uh, and Mike Helmers and myself. And, and Jim Wells is working on a number of GI organoids, including the gastric or, or intestinal or large intestinal organoid as well. And Mike Helmers is a surgeon and, and clinician scientist and, and, and developing a method to transplant the intestinal organoid to model the human development in vivo. So, so we are establishing a very a, a critical infrastructures to increase the access to the organoid technologies, including the core laboratories, including a gene editing core, or imaging core, or or epigenetics core, and so forth, and to help the clinician scientists to use the very high tech uh, approaches for the 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 organ research and also we are developing a blanket ILB uh, which enables uh, the 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 collection of the human IPS cells or or eventually to develop organoid as a banking strategies from the rare disease patients as well as the healthy kid patient populations and also we are uh, developing an accelerator laboratories which is I think a very unique infrastructures to enable the interaction between the academia and industry. So we are welcoming the industry scientists with a close proximity to our academic laboratories and to be able to, for instance, screening the, the drugs in our organic system for the commercial prototyping. And also we have the a clinical gray GMP laboratory for the tissue processing, processing in a clinical level. So these sort of uh, four major uh, accelerator components is helping the scientists to 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 use the organoid for the medical applications. And 
And we are actually dividing the four different phases uh, for the eventual development of organic medicine. So always, I think the important thing is the is the basic science part. So we are studying the human development and, and monitoring the development in, in vitro, or we can make make in the complex organ structures. So we have still many challenges, uh, which I am going to going to highlight in the later slide. So uh, we still clearly need our uh, basic science components as a major driver. But I think uh, equally important, the prototyping uh, as a second phase is also important. So, so for instance, I think if you uh, use the organoid for the drug screening, I think we need to show the, the positive evidence to predict the human clinical trials and also negative evidence to, to predict the human outcomes, which for instance, uh, the drugs uh, failed in the clinical studies has to be recapitulated in uh, disease organ conditions. Uh, so I, I think we need to show the sort of preliminary evidence for the, the organoid-based application as a prototy prototyping stage. And if you see the very promising potential, I think we can move forward move forward or move further for the translation. So so oh, we are currently working on the transplant application of liver organoids. So we are working with the large scale uh, production protocols or or larger animal model to test the efficacy or safety in uh, preclinical conditions to, to move forward. And also some of the e commercial prototyping has the potential for the industrializations. So some case, I think we are developing a startups and some case we are licensing out to the companies to, to facilitate the commercial uh, application of organoid for, for improving the accessibility for the many scientists or clinicians to use organoid-based approaches. So I'm jumping in it, into the, the basic science part, which I'm learning in my laboratory in Cincinnati. So the questions we are working at uh, Cincinnati Children's is very simple. So how we can uh, uh, know the process of organogenesis and how we model that complex process by using the human stem cell culture system. So this is the top question we are still uh, dealing with. So, you know, the, the overall, I think the organ is really driven by the basic development of biology. So I would say translational embryology is really key for the organoid development. So, you know, the e gastroration is the, the, e, e, the old the initiation of the human development or, or every devel uh, animal development. And afterwards, the, the tissues are, are specified into the progenitor stage, including the endoderm or exoderm or mesoderm. So we are particularly interested in the foregut endoderm, which is diverse from the uh, early primitive endoderm structures. So foregut endoderm is really giving rise to a variety of different organs, including the thyroid, esophagus, and run, and so forth. But we are uh, specifically interested in the uh, border between the foregut and midgut and posterior foregut portion is giving rise to the number of critical organs for the metabolism, including liver tissues, biliary tissues, or ventral pancreatic population, or those of pancreas as well. So, so what we are working on is using the human stem cells to model the molecular logics, which is identified the classical development of biology to 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 leverage that in a stem cell culture model to develop a design pr principles for recapitulating the human organ genesis in the dish. So back in 2013, we are uh, initially focusing on the most primitive process of liver butt formation or early liver development. So early liver butt is actually specified from the part of posterior foregut tooth. So also at this stage, uh, of, uh, the, the the population is named hepatic specified endodermal cells. And this is about E95, just before E95 in the mouse, or one month after gestation in humans. And hepatic specified endodermal cells at this stage is two dimensional uh, sheet like structures. But, but afterwards, uh, they are forming the liver butt structures, which is clearly a 3D and very complex structures. And interestingly, these 2D to 3D transitions is requiring the support by the additional supporting lineages, including the endothelial cells, 
and also the methane chemical or populations, which is uh, really uh, 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 found by the Dr. Ken Zawet groups. And once this river bar is formed in 3D conditions, uh, the blood perfusion is initiated afterwards. And this is really critical for pushing the cells to be more mature and finally developing a complete mature functional liver tissue structures. So what we are hypothesizing is quite simple. So can we model the 2D to 3D transitions by recapitulating these main three uh, different progenitor interactions in vitro in culture? And if that is true, uh, can we uh, push the maturation of in vitro derived organ but in vivo by producing the, the the structure from the circulations in vivo? So so this is basically a two-step hypothesis. So human iPS cells are directly differentiated into the multiple progenitors and, and, and mixed in uh, uh, well to see if we can make our, our self-organized organ but in vitro. And if we can make it, uh, uh, can we transplant into the animal model to see if we can uh, get our mature tissues in, in vivo. So, so the next slide is a simple uh, uh, summary of what we are working on initially. So uh, working with the human IPO cells under Feed of Lee, uh, provided by Dr. Shinya Yamanaka, which is actually a uh, clinical grade. So or, or directly differentiated into the three major uh, lineages in vitro. I think the, uh, to the right, I think we, uh, I'm just showing the a animation or uh, movies for the self-organization process, but it's not really coming up. But anyway, uh, using the three different lineages, including the transitional hepatic endodon population, uh, primarily marked by the TBX3, and septum mesenchyme population marked by the WT1 and primitive endothelial cell population marked by CD31 or BE calhering, we are able to make a three critical ingredients for the liver blood formations. And, uh, and using that three progenitor population, we are able to make a 3D a miniature liver blood structures in vitro. So the next slide is showing the structure of these uh, 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 in vitro liver but right structures. So in this uh, uh, pictures, uh, let is the uh, human and the DL cells uh, differentiated from the IPS cells, and, and the green one is a hepatic uh, progenitor population made by, made by the human IPS cells. And this is not really just a simple cluster. If this is aggregate, uh, you want to see a, the very sparse, uh, uh, sparse structures, but it's not. So, so they are developing network like structures from the red marked and the DL cell populations. And aligned with these beautiful uh, network like structures, uh, we see the hepatic cells are aligned in a beautiful manner. So, this is a clearly a sign of self organizations. So we uh, we term these uh, structures as vascularized liver bar organoids made by uh, a bit of 3D culture system. So we are also characterized by tissue sections or, or single cell uh, analysis and so forth to confirm these structures is uh, really close to the in vivo liver bar right tissues in, uh, of in vivo. But you know, the, the, there are uh, critical signs of self organization like uh, uh, blood vessel networks. We are expecting these tissues can be transplanted in vivo. So the next slide shows the in vivo outcomes. Here we go. Okay, so this is the transplanted liver blood tissues. And, and this whitish bar is the about one centimeter in size, and, and this is day zero. After mm -hmm. two days or three days, entire part get uh, red, which really is suggesting the cells are perfusing the entire structures made by the human iPS cells in the mouth of immunodeficient background. So once the blood perfusion is initiated after two or three days or 48 hours or 72 hours, the blood vessels are remodeled over time to form a more sophisticated uh, blood vessel structures. So the next slide is confirming the, the actual uh, 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 blood vessel network. 
so so in this try the the next one uh maybe a uh, green one or blue one is the blood perfusion in the mouse and red and green uh, uh red and uh, orange is the human cell component so if you're zooming up uh, the uh, tissues i think it's not coming out oh okay so so this is the the to the right is the human ideas and the theo networks so 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 this is just to confirm entire uh, vascular structures are formed by the human cells or human ideas cells but blood perfusion was uh, uh, initiated by the mouse saturations so i originally thought the the to the right i think that that has to be animations for confirming the chimeric vessel cell formation between the human vessels and, and mouse vessels. But it's not coming out, so I'm just skipping into the next slide. Okay. Uh, I think there are animations as well. So so this is just to to show you the 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 transplant process of liver but organo into the animal model, but it's not coming up. So I'm skipping this, and and to the bottom, uh, this is the uh, transplant liver butt. Okay, so this is uh, the number of liver butt are transplanted onto the mesenteric locations, which is close to the polar vein. And to the right, this is the Capromaya survival card, and and the sham group is is as shown here, indicated by bluebird. And after 30 days, the most of the nose is dying over time after 30 days. But but if you transplant the human liver blood organ uh, into this location, or mesenteric transplantations is rescuing the 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 liver failure, or which is result indicated by red color. So this really simply suggesting that the 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 most of the surviving mouse are uh, rescued by the functional replacement by the liver butt transplantations. And, and, and this is a, a therapeutic prototype of, of the concept of the liver butt organoid transplantations. And, but I think this approach is really, I think, universal or generalizable for the other tissue as well. So we are working on the other uh, tissue organoid model as well, including the gut tissues, lung tissues, kidney tissues or cardiac or brain and also disease tissues like cancer. So, so our 3D culture approach is, is enabling entire uh, tissues to be vascularized in vitro and to form a one centimeter tissues in vitro. And if you transfer into the, the mouse using the human cells, uh, again, uh, we are able to vascularize after 48 hours of transplantation. And, and these vessels are remodeled over time as well. And I think one of the most remarkable organ was the kidney, because I think kidney has a very tremendous or powerful potential for the in vivo self organizations. So this is just a, a microscopic uh, confocal live imaging analysis of a generated uh, kidney butt transplant. And green marks the hum, uh, mouse kidney cells, and, and red marks the the blood vessels. So combined, uh, as you see here in the middle, I think uh, very small, tiny glomeruli-like structures uh, are beautifully formed from the scratch. And this is a really, I think, remarkable aspect of the organ blood transplantation approaches. And also, we are working on the uh, pancreatic model as well. And as you see here. To the left is also the the movie for time lapse movie for the pancreatic vascularized organ information process. But again, I don't really see any videos, so I can skip here down as well. And this is the the middle is the the macroscopic view of the generated vascularized pancreatic iret, and that can be transplanted into the capsule of the kidney. And using that transplantation model, we are comparing the therapeutic potential against the fulminant diabetes model in the mouse. So to the bottom, uh, Kaplan-Meier again, survival carb, showing the, the fulminant diabetes is really severe because after four or five days, without transplantation, most of the mouse is just dying. But if you transplant the mouse primary iret uh, indicated by Bluebird, 
this uh, transplant pr approach is, is effective to some extent. So almost 50% of the mouse is recovering from the fulminant diabetes if you transplant the mouse IRETs. But you know, the, I think the IRET transplantation is really promising and, and because of the promise, it's actually tested in human or clinics as well. But the problem is the vascularization or early engraftment. So, so IRET transplantation is lacking the vasculatures. So if you combining with our older based approaches, we are expecting that uh, transplant efficiency might be improved. And, and because of that indicated by red bar, the vascularized IRET transplantation using our organ bud culture approaches is really improving the efficacy of IRET transplantations as indicated by the red, red bar. And this simply suggesting the uh, transplant efficiency is really important for the therapeutic potential against the diabetes conditions. So having that uh, proof of concept demonstrations, we are now working, uh, primarily working on the liberal organ transplantation to rescue the diseased patients. And final part of my basic science is I think the next very uh, big challenge in, in the organ field. So currently, organ scientist is just looking at the single organ to generate. So in our case, we are working on the liver tissue generation from the scratch or stem cells. But I would say I think the single organ generation approach is quite limited in terms of the longer uh, uh, in vitro maturation or longer in vivo functionalization. Because if you have uh, a defect in the surrounding structures like biliary, portion or bile duct or, or pancreatic duct, I think we have liver failed or we have damaged the liver tissues in vivo in a critical conditions. So, you know, the sort of inter-organ connections or, or multi-organ connections might be, I think, the next uh, basic science challenge to, to go forward. So, so Hilo uh, Koike, working in my laboratory in Cincinnati, spearheaded this problem. So he's working on the more complex organ model, and he he recently found the the uh, uh, so this is a reporter human iPS line slaving the human uh, prox one genes by uh, RFP. So using this reporter system, he was able to for from the for posterior forget to make uh, connecting structures, including the liver tissues, as well as a biliary portion or duodenum portion as well. So, so to the right, this is the home immunostaining staining uh, of the PROX1, which is a, a hepatic portion, and DVA is uh, the biliary portion. So combined with two colors, we are able to show the functional connection between the liver and the biliary tracts. And also we have a pancreatic to biliary connections as well as the biliary to intestinal connection as well. So this is a microscopic view of in vitro derived uh, uh, human organoid as well as a mouse real in vivo structures, which is closely resembling the human IPS organoid based approaches. So I think this kind of proof of concept approach is really important for looking at the uh, expanding the potential for other organs as well, like kidney, ureter, bladder connections or central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system connections or lung to airway connections and so forth. So I think this is a sort of very important challenge to go forward. So this is just a basic science part of, of love trees, but now, from now I'm switching a little bit for the translation applications, namely on organic medicine. So you know the organ can be developed from a patient-specific stem cells or a healthy person derived stem cells. So using that tissues, I think we can study the human-specific biology as a basic science. But more importantly, I think we can use these tissues as uh, avatar to the human disease conditions. So having that avatar, I think we are able to monitor the disease progressions or disease prevention or disease uh, treatment in vitro. So, so having that approach is I think we can envision the precision medicine application or drug testing application in the pharmaceutical industries. And ultimately using the healthier uh, stem cell organ, I think we can transform back to the patient to see if we can rescue the disease conditions. So we can, we can 
for see a number of uh, different applications using our organized based approaches. And my lab particularly interested in the liver organoid, so we initially targeting the, the, the application to the drug development process. You know, the hepatotoxicity is a very uh, a bottleneck or a critical hurdle for the drug uh, development process, especially in the later stage of clinical trials. If you have some side effects related to the liver toxicity, I think this will be causing a tremendous uh, 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 loss of the, the money and, and also the time for the development. So if you can predict the hepatotoxicity in a human specific condition, I think that would be really a tremendous for the drug development process. And now the phase two, as a next step, I think we can also use their, uh, not just our safety uh, screening, but also we can use a tissue for the efficacy screening, uh, such as uh, steroid hepatitis, which is a growing uh, 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 medical uh, problems for the number of different countries. And also, we can use the tissues for the new, potentially for the nutrition, nutritional screening for the prevention. And, and also, we can use the extracorporeal device uh, to be integrated by the organoid to, to, to use the tissues as a sort of uh, supporting device for the liver failure. But as a phase three or last phase, I think we can use uh, our tissue for the transplantations. We are currently targeting the congenital uh, metabolic uh, error of the, the patients to be treated by organ transplantations. So I would focus on the two uh, main applications in my talk. Uh, the first one is a drug efficacy screening. So as I said, I think the steatopatitis or non-alcoholic steatopatitis is uh, uh, really a growing concern in uh, many different countries. So in particularly in the uh, United States, I think NASH or uh, steatopatitis is now a uh, leading cause for the liver transplantations. So clearly we need a high, a high volume medical needs to be treated by, by some medications. But currently there are no available, surprisingly, no available effective drugs to treat the NASH conditions, although they are estimated to be opening up a huge market for, for uh, the future uh, drug industries. I think this is part, uh, partly because we are lacking an effective human model to 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 recapitulate the set of condition in vitro. So we are, are hoping to use organoid to model the NASH conditions in vitro. So <clears throat> we are spearheaded uh, this problem as well. So initially, we has developed a method to make a, a multicellular organ model, including the uh, con uh, innate immunity population or macrophage population can be co-developed in a, a liver organ conditions. So, so having the uh, immune component, so she hypothesized to see if we can recapitulate the entire process of the, the steroid hepatitis. So steroid hepatitis is initially initiated upon the hepatocytes uh, lipid accumulation, or namely uh, steatosis. But, but if you get the lipid uh, accumulated over time, I think they are activating somehow the inflammatory process uh, triggered by the macrophage or, or liver resident macrophage like Cooper cell. And after the inflammatory stimuli continues, I think the hepatocyte is getting stressed out and the cytoskeleton is disorganized and the mitochondrial are overloaded and eventually uh, 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 developed by the fibrotic population is, is expanded leading to the cirrhosis. So we expose a number of ingredients to trigger the steatosis as well as the inflammation and, the sui uh, and su to see if we can make a fibrotic condition in vitro by continued uh, uh, lipid stimulation in vitro. So, so this is just a uh, basic online model we are currently working on. So we have uh, I think this should be also moving for the uh, liver organ formation process. So, uh, so we are revising the organ model from the human IPO cells to model the micro anatomy of the human liver tissues. So we have uh, biliary canaliculi structures, which is very important for the bioacid secretions, and we have uh, biotransporters. 
uh, polarized uh, into the lumen of the human liver organoid, and we have tight junction proteins as well. And this is really close to the, the actual in vivo bioconnect rest structures indicated by EM analysis. And having that organoid tissues, I think we are able to look at the bioacid transport visualized by the fluorescent bioacid method at uh, base assays. So we are uh, able to visualize by, by live imaging to monitor the bioacid excretion pathways in an ordinary level. So this is a very, I think, important for the multiple liver base applications. And, and this organo model has a very unique advantage because we have multicellular configurations. So, so the majority of cells are composed by the human hepatocyte indicated by the EP count. And this is a epithelial cell markers. So 80% uh, actually the hepatocytes. But uh, out of the 20%, I think uh, the, uh, the half of the population is uh, uh, ALCAM, ALCAM positive or CD166 positive steroid like cell lineages, which is a mesenchymal cell population residing in uh, liver tissues. And, and, and to the bottom, I think more less minor population, but we do see the reproducible or, or EMR1 uh, positive uh, Cooper like cell population is also called developed in these liver organoid structures. So to the right, this is a whole amount of immunostaining of the single liver organoid. And as you see here, uh, majority is the EP count or e cadoherin or CEBP alpha positive hepatocyte populations. But some of the cells are by mentioning positive uh, mesenchymal cell population responsible for eventual fibrosis as well as the CD68 uh, uh, macrophage population is co-developed in these liver organoid structures. So having that multicellular configuration seen next uh, uh, expose uh, uh, fat or, or carbohydrates in vitro to see if we can induce the steatosis. So well, to the left, I think this is also the live imaging pathology like analysis in, in an organ level. So if you expose the fat, or carbohydrates in a higher level, or we are able to show the massive accumulation of triglyceride indicated by the green one uh, in the bottom uh, figure. And this is really dose dependent. So if you do not really uh, modify the culture media, I think they never get any triglyceride accumulated in. But if you increase the dose of fatty acid as well as the carbohydrates, we are able to accumulate uh, uh, extensively into the liver organoid. If you continue this lipid accumulated conditions, we are able to show the preliminary fibrosis like a, a, a phenotype in vitro. So panel H is a muscle trichrome staining, and after seven days, we see uh, some collagen depositions. And then the panel I is also the uh, immunostaining of the whole mount uh, tissue analysis. And green one is a fibrotic population, and, and red one is a epithelial cell population. So combined, I think we see the fibrosis, uh, fibrotic cell population are propagated in our uh, organ model. And panel J is a biochemical analysis of the supernatant. So, so this is a procoagulant peptide, which is also used in the clinics to diagnose the fibrosis. And this biomarker is also uh, increased in our cell hepatitis, like organo culture media. So combined, I think uh, organo is is probably able to model the preliminary aspects of the steatopatitis or fibrosis in the human specific conditions. But how much predictive in, in, in this organ model? So to test that, I think we are uh, using the gen genetic contribution to be uh, predicted in, in an organ model. So, so to test that, we are uh, looking at the three major uh, variants uh, reported by others, uh, published in Nature Genetics uh, back in 2017 last year. So, so using these three major, uh, most significant uh, variants, uh, we are stratifying or make a meta ranking of 2,500 of genotype available stem cell lines. And, and, and made a, a, a risk stratified panel. So high risk patient stem cell lines and middle risk patient stem cell lines or a minimal risk or 
the low risk uh, stem cell range to see if we can model the uh, uh, genetic condi conditions in a uh, 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 selected couple of stem cell lines. And to, to the right, this is a triglyceride uh, staining in an organ level using the different risk patient populations. And as you see here, high-risk patient stem cell organoid is accumulating the triglyceride much higher extent uh, than the middle-risk stem cell or low-risk stem cell-derived organoid. So this really is simply suggesting that genetic factors identified by the hundreds of thousands of uh, patient uh, genotype analysis can be predicted by the couple of uh, different stem cell line analysis in an uh, organ level. So this is, I think, very remarkable to predict the phenotype in, in, in humans using the couple of stem cell lines. So, so having that uh, uh, correlation in the humans, we now test the clinical uh, trials like condition in vitro using the kindly testing compounds like ovetic holic acid as well as uh, FG of 19. So to the left, this is like a efficacy analysis uh, like copper myia survival curve. Uh, but this is a uh, organized survival curve. So, so if you look at the uh, uh, blue or uh, light blue bar, this is a non-drug uh, treated condition. So this is like a sham group. So organoid is eventually dying off over time. But if you expose the ovary cholic acid or FGF19, which is remarkably uh, improving the survival after the steatosis stimuli. As, the, as indicated by the pink as well as the dark gray. And if you do not really expose the fat, I think they are surviving over time. So this really uh, uh, highlighting the organoid-based survival outcomes is uh, 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 somehow similar to the clinical trials tested in phase three for the NASH. But not just for the efficacy-like analysis, I think we can use the surviving organoid for the further mechanistic studies. So for instance, this is uh, comparing the reactive oxygen species, which is also the trigger for the inflammatory process in the hepatocytes. So, so we see the uh, massive accumulation of low, uh, reactive oxygen species in a fat-treated organoid, but that can be a, uh, improved or decreased by the already cholic acid treatment or FC19 treatment as well. And this is a quantitative analysis. And also, I'm not really going into detail because of the time limitations, but, but a fibrosis can be predicted by the stiffness measurements per organoid. And, and if you look at the steatohepatitis organoid, the, the, the untreated one uh, uh, is really low, but if you increase the fibrosis like conditions in the organoid, the stiffness is really highly upregulated as indicated by the blue uh, bar. But, but that stiffness increase can be also canceled or inhibited by the FG19 or also FG albedicolic acid. So this is really a, a suggesting or highlighting that potential for the clinical trials like uh, condition in the dish. So by multiplying the genetic factors as well as the lifestyle factors or screening factors, we are able to uh, conduct the human organoid-based trials or hot trials, which we named for the efficacy screening in vitro in the future. And we also developed in the higher throughput form for measuring the stiffness measurement, which is not really showing up here. And also we are working on the sort of uh, digital solution to be integrated to, to monitor the organ in a wireless manner and so forth. But anyway, we are uh, uh, expecting in the future organ trials can be very meaningful too for the clinical trials. And as a last part of my presentation is focusing on the phase three application, which is the namely uh, transplantations. So I think organ oil or organ but transplantation is sort of intermediate approaches with the currently prevailing organ transplant, as well as the hepatocytes or cell wall transplantation. So this is the organ oil transplant transplantation. So what we want to prove is to make a functional organ by transplanting very immature tissues or very immature organ oil to see if we can eventually rescue the metabolic liver disease. So I think there are a couple of uh, uh, leading initiatives working on the transplantations. I think uh, Tokyo Medical Dental University, which is also my second affiliation, and, but not my group, but different group is also working on the transplantation of organoid. 
initially targeting of the inflammatory bowel disease using adult stem cell organoid, and also the Netherlands or European group or, or our group or Cincinnati Children's is also working on the organoid transplantation application for treating the currently intractable disease. So I think the next slide is just a simple view of the, or, or what we want to do in the future. This is quite simple. So organoid manufacturing and transplant into the patients, uh, hopefully transplant uh, uh, even, or within a couple of years. So this is simple, but I think it's really challenging because number of different components for organoid production has to be supported by the industry partners because I think we need to have a critical grade media or we have to have a clinical grade culture plates, or we have to develop a clinical uh, predicting the uh, preclinical animal model of the small lot model, or sometimes requiring a large animal model as well. And we have to develop a clinical uh, validation protocols by microscopic analysis as well as other biochemical assays. And probably we I, I somehow need a robotic support for scaling up the process. So so this is really, I think, very challenging and too, too much for the academic scientists. Mm -hmm. So we need a, a collaborative networks by uh, working with the number of different industry partners to do that. So I'm just showing a couple of different examples of the collaboration with the companies. So so this is the the our mass production platform by collaborating with the with the chemical companies called the Kulare. So we have developed a clinical gray a micro well prey uh, which is an omni well one well array prey platform where we wherein we have the twenty thousand micro wells are uh, are placed over the well plates. And we can make a very homogeneous, uh, beautiful or uh, miniature organized structures in a, a, a single culture time. So, and to the right, this is the collected uh, human liver organoid from the preprocessed stem cell, just showing you the homogeneous uh, tissue can be formed in a very large scale manner. So we have the mass production platform. And also we are working on the robotic companies to make uh, GMP manufacturing facilities. So this effort was pre uh, primarily led by Dr. Tani Gucci working in uh, Yokohama City University in collaboration with my laboratory. And as you see, uh, oh, I think this also is a movie, but, but uh, we have the robotic uh, automated uh, machines to, to make our uh, hundreds of uh, of organoid can be manufactured in a continuous manner, in an isolated manner, which is a clinical grade. So having that uh, collaborations, we are hoping to transplant back to the patients within the next few years by initially targeting the urea cycle disorders. So, so for this particular application, we are uh, using the human iPS cells provided by the Kyoto University. I think as you are already aware, but Dr. Jun Takahashi at Kyoto University initiated the clinical trials using this uh, particular IPS line for the Parkinson's disease last week, actually. This is very uh, quite uh, exciting. But using the same IPS line they are using, we are also preparing for the clinical trials for the liver disease by developing a GMP grade manufacturing process and, and transplant back to the patients to see if we can uh, improve the clinical outcomes. So, so within the other three indications, I think we have tremendous demand. So, as I highlighted in a, a, in a background slide, uh, we have over four thousands of patients are just dying during the waiting period for the liver transplantations. And, but this is really underestimated, I think. And also, we have multiple different countries waiting for all the liver transplantations. So I think, I think uh, to fair to be fair, I think currently overall 68 over almost 100,000 of patients are, are waiting to die for the liver transplantations. So I think this patient population can be absolute the indication for even for the challenging organoid-based approaches. Uh, but within this sort of absolute indication, I think we can open up a very uh, large promising uh, uh, market for the future commercialization. So so this is just a summary of my talk. And uh, I think we, in the future, I think we can transfer back to the patient, especially in a very end stage or uh, a very chronic or uh, organ failure condition, which we can certainly transplant organ into the patients. But I think organ transplantation or cell 
The P product is really expensive, so I think we need to narrow down the indications to really specifically targeting the patients who cannot really treat it by other modalities. But I think majority of the patients is benefited by the precision medicine application or drug treatment, so I think Organa is really meaningful to still for the drug screening or precision type of applications. So this is a, a, just a, a sort of a overall big picture of what we are predicting in the future by using all kind of medicine applications. With that, I'd like to thank all my members in the laboratories as well as the collaborators, and thank you so much for your attention and happy to take some questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Takebe, for that really amazing presentation. Uh, so we'll now begin the live uh, question and answer portion of this webinar. Uh, so I'd like to remind you again, if you do have a question that you'd like to ask, uh, please do so now by clicking on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question in the box that appears on your screen and then just click the Send button. So with that, uh, let's get started. Uh, so Dr. Takebe, we, we do have a few questions here. Um, one of the questions that has come in is uh, what do you think are the technologies that will be driving your organoid 4.0? Hello. Uh, okay, so you were asking about this uh, question number two? Uh, question number eight. Number eight, okay, technologies will be driving organoid 4.0. So I think, I think, I think it's it's there are a couple of uh, differences depending on the application. So for instance, I think drug screening application, I think technologies we are lacking is the sort of higher throughput screening system. So so for instance, I think uh, in our organ model, we are, are sort of using the live imaging approaches or live stiffness measuring approaches to predict the set of arthritis conditions. But I think still, I think the throughput is limited to, to test, I think, uh, at best, I think we can test the hundreds of compounds in the organ level, but uh, in a real world or in a real uh, drug screening uh, uh, companies, I think they are testing over hundreds of thousands of compounds in a, uh, uh, in a cell line model. So we need to increase the throughput uh, extensively. So for the particular drug screening application, I think we, what we are lacking or what we need is for the uh, higher throughput instruments to measure the the organ readouts in a higher speed. So that with that, I think we are collaborating with the sort of uh, micro robotics uh, scientist or microfluidics uh, scientist to to make our make this happen. So so I think depending on applications, but particularly for the drug screening, I think we microfluidic type of application is really important. But for the transplant application, transplant application is really different. So so transplantation is uh, really critical, uh, really driven by the, 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 I think, the mass production in a clinical grade. So just making the tissues in a larger scale is quite easy, I think. But, but in a clinical grade manufacturing process is, I think, really challenging. Because we need uh, validation protocols, or and, uh, and also we have uh, uh, to manufacture in a very clean or very clinical grade and 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 facilities to to make sure they are pretty safe, and and also we need to test all of the mass-produced tissues in the animal model to confirm the safety to make sure we do not really develop a tumors or uncontrollable or cancer-like tissues in vivo. So clinical grade manufacturing or mass production is really critical technologies we are still dealing with for the transplant application. So it's really depending on the application, but I think there are a couple of key hurdles still existing. And how far away do you think that kind of technology is? Is this something you think we'll see in the next couple of years, another five to 10 years? So yes, we are we are actually planning to transfer and within three years from now. So we are almost in the final process of the manufacturing process as well as the validation process. So uh, currently we are uh, planning on the safety uh, uh, trials with the pre uh, 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 efficacy uh, with the aim of of obtaining the efficacy signals 
we create an efficacy analysis. We are planning on that 2020 or 2021 to be initiated. So it's not really far future. And for the precision medicine, I think as you already know, the cystic fibrosis application is already initiated in a Hans Krieber's group in the Netherlands. So, so they're using the organoid tissues for model or predict the human condition in a cystic fibrosis to de derive organoid. And they are actually selecting the effective drugs and now treated by the drugs selected by the organoid. So for the precision medicine, I think it's already happening. So, so it's not really far future. I think it's a really tangible feature. Okay. Um Thanks for that. Uh, and it's actually kind of a good segue to one of the other questions that are, is here as it relates to uh, adult tissue-derived organoid models. Uh, as you know, some of the other models that are out there, uh, there there's an adult tissue-derived liver organoid model as well. Uh, per perhaps you could compare your model with that model and what you think the sort of the advantages and disadvantages are of, of the existing models today. Thank you so much. I think this is really important. So I think we have good and bad. So for the IPS or ESL, derived organoid model has an advantage for the multicellular configuration. So I think mostly the adult tissue derived organoid is a epithelial cell structure. So we have a couple of cell types, but, but mostly are epithelial cell types. But IPS or ESL based approach, we are able to co-develop uh, supportive lineages, including the mesenchyme components and also immune components. And, and, and in addition to that, we have epithelial components. So multicellular configuration is, I think, important. But the downside of organoid uh, from the IPS or PSC is the, I think, the maturation stage. So, you know, the adult stem cell is adult derived, but IPS or ES cells is, is from the, the embryos or, uh, or egg stage. So it's really a uh, fetal, fetal embryonic stage. So functionality of the IPS or PSC model is a little bit immature or, or completely less mature than adult stem cell organoid. So for the drug screening application or some of the organ functions, it's a little difficult to you know, to predict in a PSC based model, but can do with the adult stem cell organ model. But interestingly, I think for the transplantation, I think the adult uh, tissue derived is a little difficult to engraft in vivo, probably because of the lack of supporting components, and probably because the immaturity is really important for the eventual engraftment. So. So I think well, for the transplant application, we are intentionally using the immature or less mature uh, organoid tissues for the transplantation to improve the in vivo outcomes. So it's, there are many uh, are still arguable points for the APSC derived or adult stem cell derived organoid model, but, but each has a different uh, advantage for the different applications. I think we have time for, for just another question here. Um, so a question that just, just came in uh, is asking, regarding transplantation into liver disease patients, have you estimated just how many organoids you would actually need to transplant to have a therapeutic benefit? Thank you so much. So, so currently we are planning to transplant over, I think, 100,000 of organoid per patient with the congenital disease uh, for the kids, so which is equivalent to the 10 to the 8th or or less than 10 to the 9th cell or number equivalent, uh, hepatocyte equivalent. So this uh, number is actually a determined by the previous clinical trials of the primary hepatocyte transplantation actually uh, 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 implemented in the clinics. So for the hepatocyte transplantation, I think the, in the clinics, the uh, uh, physicians are transplanting over 10 to the eighth hepatocytes into the patient and already see the benefit uh, from the disease uh, uh, conditions. So, so we are uh, probably initially planning to transplant the equivalent number of hepatocyte transplantation, which is about hundreds of thousands of organoids. To, to initiate clinical trials. Thank you so much for asking the questions. <laughs> that is a lot of organoids. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a lot. <laughs> so, so with that, we'll, we'll bring this webinar to a close. 
Uh, once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Takebe for his, his really excellent presentation here. Uh, and before we go, uh, please note that today's webinar will be available for on-demand viewing through February 2019. And thank you all for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of today's event. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.